welcome to the Sentient Media podcast, where we meet the people who are changing the way we think about and interact with the world around us. And our guest today is Pete Paxton. And Pete is an active undercover investigator who has been involved in animal cruelty investigations since 2001, which is just incredible. Um, the work that he's been doing un has been uncovering the abuse at puppy mills, at factory farms, slaughterhouses, commercial fishing boats, and at pet stores. And I'm sure there's many other things that I haven't listed there. Um, but Pete has worked all over the world in the US, uh, in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, India, the Philippines. The work that he's done has been covered in HBO documentaries, Dealing Dogs and Death on a Factory Farm, which I recommend you to watch. If you don't want to watch those, then you should grab his book, which is Rescue Dogs. He has also been awarded a coin of excellence from the US Attorney's Office in Arkansas for his role as an undercover investigator to help shut down a seller of dogs and cats to research labs. Uh, so Pete, I mean, that's just a small kind of snapshot into, into your, your last uh, 20 years in this field, but it's such an honor to have you on the podcast. So thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I am, I'm a big, big supporter of uh, sentient media and a lot of the work that I do um, would go nowhere uh, without sentient media promoting. Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's awesome uh, to see what you've done and you know, anytime I get an email from you, I get so excited. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what are we doing now, Pete? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, like I said, so much of your work has involved going undercover for like periods of weeks or months. Um, and you've done stuff like with undocumented immigrants um, who have been exploited a lot in agriculture and all these different factors um, amongst all these commercial animal operations that lead to all of this, you know, predictable criminal behavior that you uncover. Um, but I'm curious, like, what's it like going undercover for such long periods of time? Like, what is that like? Yeah, um, so the, uh, a lot of the employment-based cases, I guess the more recent ones, they haven't been as long. Some of them, you know, it's like six, six weeks or something, maybe two weeks, um, but I've done some where it's six months at a time um, or you're just having to go back undercover continually. And um, it is, it is, it, it, it's, it, it's only, it's, it's a little difficult to answer only because what I've discovered now after so much time away is that you're in the zone when you're there. And then um, what I thought at the time was like that when I'm leaving, like, oh, okay, I'm out of it and now I'm back in normal life. But it's not really like that. There's like a little bit that stays with you and, and it took me a long time to learn how it was staying with me, how it was affecting me and what I had to do to, to deal with that. Um, so uh, I, I, I think that it's, it's also that you kind of like, you get, um, you, you get a little bit used to it, you know, being, being you know, dealing with all that, you know, everything, everything that's going on, but, but you also like, like you get used to the cruelty as well, so that you're just like the other workers and that, you know, um, when there's animal, like you, you, you start to forget, oh, there's animal screening, there's blood flying everywhere. Oh, right. Right. I'm supposed to get, like, I can't tell you how many times I've forgotten, like, oh, right. I'm supposed to get the campaign shots of that. I'm just looking for, I know this one guy is going to commit this crime. I'm looking for that. Right, because you, you've gotten so used to it. Um, yeah, it's, I, know it's, I know it's kind of a sorry, uh, listeners. This is going to be the most depressing and stressful episode of this entire podcast series. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's yeah. my guess. No, I mean it, it's it's super important, and I think that a lot of us. You know, it's almost like um, with people who is this cognitive dissonance thing, right, where people don't want to uh, like look at things or they don't want to engage with things to kind of, you know, like in enhance their own um, behaviors and their own mindset. And I think that quite often, like even within like the animal protection space, like we don't consider and we don't uh, talk to or, uh, you know, want to really think about what people who go undercover have to deal with. Um, and, and as an undercover person, you you know, your identity is completely shifted. Um, and you've yeah. been in this field for such a long time. Like we're talking 20 years, over 20 years now. And I, I know like a lot of under, uh, undercover investigators do it for, you know, a period of, of months uh, or maybe even a period of years. But I mean, can you imagine doing anything else? Like was this the plan to kind of do this like forever? 
Um, I, I have no idea what else I would do. I mean, I suppose that it's, it's possible, but um, there has been a point when I thought this career was over for me. There's actually been more than one point. I thought like, this is it, can't keep going. Turns out I could, right? But, um, but yeah, when I reached that point, I was trying to figure out if I could go into animal cruelty investigations and law enforcement and it didn't work out. And, you know, I'm glad that it ultimately didn't, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, when I reached that point, I thought to myself, I'll continue to help the animal rights movement as an activist somehow, but I'm going to go do investigations some other way because really? that's, that's just, that's just where my heart is. It, 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 but you're right. It's like, it's hard to know like how to like, how to think about it or what else to do. And one of the things that I can remember is that, um, when I when I started, there's the mindset that I developed for how to think about investigations and what I'm doing. And then I learned very quickly that activists don't think about it the same way. And um, I found that there's other people that do think about it, but it's not, it's it's um it's like a it's like a defense mechanism that you gotta put up um, so that so that you are not going crazy with the stress of what you're dealing with and, and the trauma of what you're dealing with, but at the same time can then try to step back and be objective later. That has, that, the, the thing that really has come to, that, that I've been dealing with lately with that is, is with the, where the anti-carceral movement deals with animal rights, right? Which is like, I have to be sympathetic, I, I gotta be sympathetic to the workers, um, which to be honest, I would have, always have been, but that I need to be, I need to let that affect, you know, when I'm putting stuff together, how does that mean I'm working a case and then going to make a recommendation to a prosecutor or law enforcement, or if this should go to a prosecutor or law enforcement. And um, it's, it, it, it's very difficult to explain how to think about that to the, to the activist community, because um, when I've talked to, like when I've talked to a therapist, you know, which no surprise there. I've talked to a bit therapist about this stuff, or when I've talked to friends of mine who are, uh, um, you know, if they if they served in the military or if they've done undercover work um, as you know as in, in law enforcement, um, there's a completely different way about talking about this than when I talk to animal rights activists, and it's like it's like we're just on totally different wavelengths. And I'm trying to exist in a world where I'm on both at once, and it's difficult. Like, can you elaborate a bit on that? Like, could you give me an example, perhaps, of like one thing that you could say, you know, to like say, like somebody who's served in the military versus how you would have to present the same thing to somebody in an animal activist community? Sure. Um, so I remember um, there was. Okay, the, okay, there was the, the first case that I ever did, there was that HBO documentary called Dealing Dogs made about it, right? And it was, I don't have to go into a lot of gory detail. Um, my goal in this interview is to not make listeners cry. Okay, that's what I'm gonna try to do. Okay, we appreciate right. that. <laughs> yeah, cool, okay. But really bad stuff happening and, and to dogs, right? And in fact, the stuff was so bad that when the documentary came out, um, in fact, before the documentary came out, it was just like the evidence got released. And I remember that the, the group I did the case for sent me handwritten letters that were sent to them. One was sent by an active duty soldier and one was sent by an ex-cop. And both of them said they would have killed people um, for doing to dogs, you know, what they saw in the documentary. The amount of letters that I got from just ordinary people saying the same thing, right? Um, and it was that the you know and, and so I was there for six months and it was that the the mindset that I had to have about what I was doing and and why I was doing it and how I could talk about it was I, I real I realized after didn't line up with activists when I saw online that by the time the documentary came out I looked at what people had to say. 90% of their comments were not about the case or about dogs being sold to research or pet theft. 90% of the comments were about me and half of them were negative. And it was people saying, how could this guy let this happen to these dogs? Why would he participate in any of this? I remember um, there was a slaughterhouse I worked at. It was like this, uh, it was like this um, sheep and goat slaughterhouse. 
and I'm on the kill side, but I'm not on the actual, like where they're slit in the throat the kill side, right? So I go down, listeners, you're not going to cry. <laughs> I promise, right? So I go down and it's, and it's a halal thing, right? So there's not like, they're not getting stunned, right? They're just like, you know, bolt cut, bolt cut. And so I, I go down there and, and I'm trying to spend time talking to the guy who's slit in the throats before the carcasses are getting up to my part of the line. And I'm right up on him so I can film this, right? And I got no excuse other than like, I'm really interested in how you do these halal killings. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, you want to try it out. And I'm undercover. So to me, when someone says that, there is no hesitation. There is, okay, I'm going to do this. And I remember talking to, um, I'm not going to say who, but I was talking to a very experienced activist um, who asked me, well, what did you do? Well, I, I slit the lamb's throat and he couldn't believe it. And it was like this light went off of like, oh, like whenever I tell that buddy or tell that story to my other buddies that do undercover work in any capacity, they, would, they didn't need to ask. But for activists, they would even bother to think, what would I do in that situation, right? And so it's like, um, it's the, the, the thing is, is that with undercover work, as opposed to other kinds of investigations like surveillance, which I do, or as opposed to any other form of activism, um, you have this degree of whether you could call it disregard or leeway with your morality, right? Like, I believe it's wrong to kill animals. I killed animals working undercover. I believe it's wrong to eat animals. I eat animals when I work undercover. Um, and that I do not believe that is behavior. I, do, I believe it's wrong to lie. I lie when I'm undercover. I don't have that behavior when I'm not undercover. And I don't believe anyone else should have that behavior. I believe I should have accountability for what I do. But I do believe that specifically with undercover work, animal rights movement, military, law enforcement, it doesn't matter that there are different rules you're gonna abide by even for foundational beliefs that you have. And some people get that, some people don't. Yeah, I mean, it's like that you have to have two sides, you know, or, you know, we all have many sides, but very clearly distinct, distinction between having to do something because you see the, the outcome of it. You see that legislation might change. You see that you are contributing to a world where nobody has to slit the lamb's throat um undercover investigator or otherwise um i'm curious like you what you do it is so risky obviously for yourself for you know if you did hesitate for example when they you know he's like oh do you want to give it a go if you did hesitate then you're putting yourself you know in danger as well like have you because you might get exposed and you know who knows what happens then um have you like always been you know, into taking risks? Has it been something that's, you know, it, during your childhood, were you like the kid who was doing the daring kind of risky stuff? Um, I have been. Um, I guess I guess one thing I should say is that is it definitely the work is risky and definitely at times it is abs like absolutely without question, there's times I've been on cases where I was really concerned I was going to get killed if I got made. The majority of the work I've been undercover in, it's not as risky as you'd think. I've had people, I've had people like I've been, you know, and then people say, what the hell are you doing here? You know, we, we you know, and, and you're not supposed to be here. And it's all I had to do was just look at them and then they, they back away. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not as bad as you might think in most cases, but, but, but yes, I've, I've always taken risks. I love taking risks. I have a lot of broken bones and concussions to, to that effect, you know, it's, it's um, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. If, if there's not, if, if risk taking is not a normal part of life, then I'm, I'm, I'm bored pretty quick. Yeah, I think I, I kind of could have figured that out without asking. Um, so I mean, this week, I'm excited to talk to you because we're taking this closer look um, at the underreported world of meatpacking. And I, you know, I've been vegetarian, vegan, like my whole life. I've never, well, you know, since I was a kid, I've never really thought about meatpacking or that step of the process. Um, I mean, I haven't even pictured what a meatpacking facility looks like. So I was curious if you could tell us, you know, what happens in a meatpacking facility and um, what work you've done in meatpacking facilities. Yeah, so, okay, it has been, um, I've, I've worked undercover, like what you would call like a conventional employment-based undercover case at all kinds of slaughterhouses in the United States, you know, uh, uh, goat and sheep, 
I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Goat and lamb, and then veal and, and cattle, uh, um, chicken and turkey. And then I've I've done a dog slaughter case in the Philippines. Um, and then I have done, and then I've been in uh, throughout Mexico, through all all across Mexico. I've been to all kinds of slaughterhouses. Um, some are large, you know, just conventional um, industrial slaughterhouses, and then others with these things called rostros that are. Some of them were literally nothing more than a concrete slab on the ground with a with a roof over it, and you bring your own uh, slaughter tools and animals to kill them there in that area. Um, and that's similar to also uh, Amish slaughter and wet market slaughter I've documented in the U.S. So it's given me like this this th 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 when we think about slaughter the way most of us think about it is you have a big slaughterhouse and animals are going in and they're all getting killed, right? But I've like I've I've documented uh, you know illegal slaughter in the U.S. as well, and I've gotten to see how that's done in a way that is terrible by itself i've also seen how it's done in a way that that is like it matches what i've seen at these smaller slaughterhouses in in mexico but it's hard to say it's any less humane than the larger slaughterhouses right and there's a different way that we treat it and then of course where where the um where the you know the doing those cases and considering all of that you know, intersectionality with the anti-carceral movement and anti-racism has got to come in super quick because you're large. Because in the, in the U.S., the vast majority of the people that are that are working in slaughter, you know, they're going to be Mexican South American. And if you're talking about illegal slaughter um, in the U.S., you're talking also Mexican South American or or like the wet markets. You know, um, where, where that's a typical thing in, in major U.S. cities all over the place. Um, a lot of people don't know that, you know, we have these areas where, you know, you, you go to and you pick out your chicken and, and someone's going to go and they're going to kill the animal and, you know, cut off the chicken's head, throw them in a trash can and they flop around and they, they prep the animal for you. Right. And we, and, and we tend to not want to talk about these issues because it's, a, there's a lot of immigrants that are doing stuff like that. But I think that we need to wrap our head around it. So that so that we can learn to um, so that so that we're not we're not trying to just like ignore them but figure out how to deal with it. And I and I have so much about that, but that that's experience is all of that, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about this work, like obviously yourself, you know, excluded from because you're in a different. Um, mindset when you're there but like what does the job look like for the workers like in your experience do the people tend to seem like they are fulfilled in their job are they getting like you know job fulfillment are they do they seem happy does it seem like a place where people are excited to go to work and, and do this stuff no <laughs> um, <laughs> um <laughs> no, but so, so 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 here's the thing um is, is that uh, when you have when you have like the large industrial slaughterhouse um yeah you you typically have this environment where i mean it's like you're a number like the animals are a number right and um you know it, it depends i mean it, it for, for me it would depend on what side of the border i'm on right because if i'm if i'm you know the united states i mean it's going to be you know, it's going to be ninety nine percent Hispanic workers, right, from Mexico, South America, and there's going to be different races of management, but more likely to be white. Those USDA inspectors, the government inspectors, they're going to be white, and they're in charge. They got a different colored helmet, that lets you know they're in charge, right? And you know, there's ways to fool immigration and to fool the process to determine if you're a citizen or not. So there's a large amount of undocumented immigrants that are working in these jobs. And that fear that they constantly have just pervades everything, right? It's hard to show up. It's hard to show up to work and you're just grinding yourself to the bone in, in, in a job that's, that's so difficult, it's almost inhuman to even do. And then you're constantly afraid that if you speak up for your own rights, that you're going to be arrested, demonized, you and your family are going to get kicked back across the border, right? But you go south of the border 
and you do the same job, and it's different, right? You're not going to get paid as much, but you have more respect for what you, more people have respect for what you do, right? It's easier to have more self-respect, right? And you know, you know that, you know, that's, yeah, you're like, I mean, even in those small slaughterhouses, you know, people could be proud of, of, of what they're doing. Do you like, do you have a, a sense of the things that are um, like considered? So within the illegal slaughterhouse network in the US, which you, you know, I didn't know about that until you told me about it. I, you know, I mean, it makes sense in hindsight, but I just have never considered illegal slaughterhouses in the US. But do you have a sense of what the rights are of the workers in league you know in the nicest you know most highly graded most humane slaughterhouse out there versus in these illegal slaughters uh, slaughterhouses versus um you know south of the border sure illegal slaughter is going to be very small it's going to be that you're you're just you know you got um you have your own little operation in a yard or out in the woods or whatever and then you know you just take the animals and you and you kill them and and that's it. it's going to be it's generally going to be like you know maybe people work there but it's going to be family run you know, so that that's what it's going to be. And the thing with that is that um, you have like where you have these smaller slaughterhouses that are that are out in, you know, like, like say the rostros I was talking about in Mexico. Um, you know, you you have people that will show up and it's like there's no there's no oversight of any kind. So I saw like, you know, I saw a bull, I, I saw a grown bull get killed with a sledgehammer to the head and, you know, and, and hogs get stabbed with, I saw a seven-year-old kid using a knife to try and kill a hog tied with a, uh, 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 he, had a, he had a rope tied around his leg to a stake and was stabbing him on the wrong side of his chest, but his dad was drinking beer and, you know, um, you know, wasn't saying anything, right? And, uh, but was not concerned, I was openly filming and the guy had no concern about it, right? Because that's just, that's how it is, right? And so when you, you know, when, when, and then of course you go to the large slaughterhouses anywhere in the world, US, Mexico, you know, doesn't matter. Right? And, um, and then you see the amount of, the things might be efficient, but up until those animals get in there, there's a hell of a lot of abuse that goes on, right? And, you know, um, and it's on a mass scale. Right. So what you have is you have a whole lot of people that they're used to doing things a certain way. Like I know how to butcher animals. Right. And if I go down to the livestock auction, I can people from my community are going to sell their animals. I'm going to buy them. I'll kill them myself. Or my buddy has got a space in his backyard for killing them. I'm going to take them there. Like, why would I go to this big corporate you know, place? Right. Um, you can't even you can't take your, your animal to the big corporate place and bring your animal out. So um you know, it's like I, so, and so you, you, you can have a lot of sympathy for these workers and a lot of sympathy for why they would want to do things a different way. But just because it's a mom and pop backyard place, like, and it doesn't matter. It's not like it, it makes no difference where they're from. I mean, I've seen Amish people do it. It's, it's horrendous, right? But um, there was a slaughterhouse that I hit in California and it was um, this guy, Roberto Celadon. Yeah, um, and his, uh, you know, he was he was killing all these, you know, sheep and goats. He had all these different animals, and the we, I filmed him. So first of all, his slaughterhouse was illegal, but he got nailed not just for that, but the manner in which I saw him kill two animals was by itself a cruelty violation. It wasn't even humane how he did it, right? Um, and so it's like it's like you know, there, there's so much to square with this issue, right? Like, like, what does that mean for slaughter? What does that mean for animals? But also what does that mean? Like, like if you're, if, if, if we're trying to help out the workers, right? Like, what do we do when we come across like an illegal operation? Do we let it go? What if they're documented? Well, what if they're not, right? In that case, I needed a legal mechanism to bust this guy. And because there was a mechanism, because that mechanism was used, 60, I believe it was 64 animals were taken out and sent to the Gentle Barn Sanctuary in California and let their lives were saved, right? Um, so there's a happy ending to that story. Um, but yeah, it becomes complicated quick. Yeah, that's so, 
that's a nice a nice happy a happy end to that story that's a yes they yeah. <laughs> yeah. do exist um i mean it, it, it's really funny because when you look at like when we get so um in the activist community or, or outside you know when we see stories that are being published about you know slaughterhouse workers meatpacking facilities etc we're so focused on what we can see in front of us and that's you know the individuals who are on the kill line or you know the people who are kicking the animals whatever um and we just it, it's like we become blind and this is true across like all kind of crime like those people the drug uh, user on the street is going to go to prison but you know the sacklers are going to you know remain free with their billions it's yeah. like yeah. this how, how do you use your undercover investigative work to tackle the the, the real uh, what I would consider you know the, the real criminals in this situation who are the ones who are running you know JBS who are doing it on the, such a huge scale that that's a good question because I'm I'm learning as I go, and this is why it's so important that we have intersectionality in the movement. It's so it's why it's so important that we have um, anti-racist and the anti-carceral movement coming into the animal rights movement. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There's a um, there has been um, the majority of the cases that I've done. Um, it's that you know law enforcement prosecutor would go after the workers, not go after the owner. Now, in some cases they would. I've worked cases where getting a confession from, you know, the owner of the facility meant he, he got convicted or, um, or I worked at an egg farm where, you know, it was civil charges of animal cruelty brought against the company, you know, and that, and that worked out. Um, um, and there's creative ways to do it, you know, for, for, uh, you know, hitting a facility and saying your animal welfare, what's happening doesn't match up with your animal welfare standards, you know, um, but it's, it's, it's very difficult. And, and there have been cases that I've worked where there have been workers that have been prosecuted. And I look back at some of those cases and I say to myself, like, I, I, I wish I didn't push for prosecution on that one, you know, and what, what has happened is that, um, um, since I, I can tell you like this, this is how I see it, man, <laughs> is that, you know, over, over all this time is that um, because is it, it used to be, I would say like the first 10 years of my career, everyone used to say, you're lying, you're doctoring the video, you're making this up, right? And part of the reason is that no one could believe that what they were seeing could actually happen, right? Everyone always used to say, my parents and my grandparents raised animals and they didn't do that. Bullshit, they did. It's that there weren't cameras around the film at the time, right? Um, it, like cruelty didn't suddenly spring into existence for large and small operations. Um, but, 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 you know, we have a lot of cognitive dissonance and we weren't around to see a lot of that stuff. And, and so we, you know, but it's, you know, so we, people couldn't believe it. But when law enforcement, even though law enforcement has, consistently is they're inactive or, or corrupt on these issues um, because law enforcement was, was began taking action of some kind on these cases by like 2011 is when I, is when it stopped. People stopped saying these are isolated incidents or you doctored the video. The public, the media began accepting cruelty happens, right? But whether like, you know, right or wrong, whatever the case is, is that I believe that that has really led to a point where people see things for how they are now, but we are definitely at a point now where it's that um, there needs to be less law enforcement action on the workers for predictable activity. And there's this, there's this one case everybody likes to, to point to, this butterball case that Mercy for Animals did and the investigator um, I have her blessing to discuss her, it was named Liz Pashad. Um, she's a, a good friend of mine, the second investigator uh, that I ever trained. She's an absolute badass. Um, and she worked at this turkey farm and there were a bunch of these, you know, these, you know, poor black workers, right? Like they're like no social agency of any kind, you know? Um, and, uh, and man, you know, they, they were doing some, they were doing some cruel stuff to the turkeys, but everybody did. And, and Liz was hesitant in, in wanting to testify against them and, and have charges brought against them. And I was one of the people that said, no, you know, there's gotta be justice on this case. Something has to be done. 
And you know, I wish I hadn't, wish I had not pushed her on that. And those guys got convicted. And 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 it, you know, it's it's you know, it, there's there's a fine, right? It's not most of the time people are convicted. It's not like they go to they're going, they're not most the vast majority of the time, no one's going to jail, right? It's very rare you go to jail, but it's a conviction. It, it messes up your record, it, it stigmatizes you, right? And um you know, I, I think that there's a lot of people that like, like they may not, they may not understand that it's like, like in that case, Liz had a much deeper understanding of what was going to happen in that case than I think, than, than anyone who's talked about it. No one has, for example, no one has ever called Mercy for Animals and says, well, it said, you know, I want to talk to Liz because I'm writing about this case, right? That case just gets written about a lot. No one knows, you know, what happened. Um, and, and so with that case and with other cases I've done, I wish I didn't push for prosecution all the time, but it's hard. It's hard, right? Because it's like, when I, when I will work, like that, I, I worked a case for seed um, and it was an auction slash slaughterhouse. And I see these animals that are going into auction and they're going into slaughter and people are beating the living hell out of these animals, right? And so, you know, it's pretty damn cool. And fortunately we had, we found federal violations for disease traceability we could go after and hit the target. But what if we didn't find that? What if all that we found was a bunch of cruelty? What are we supposed to do, right? Um, you know, and, and you know, we don't want the workers to be persecuted, but we want the animals to be helped. You know, what if, what if um, um, like, you know, like the illegal slaughterhouse that I came across, right? Like that guy, Roberto Sullivan, um, you know, what if I come across another illegal slaughterhouse today, right? What if, what if the guy running it is, is a U.S. citizen? What if he's not, right? What, what do I, should I, what, what if I know law enforcement is, is, you know, is, is going to be nice? What if they're not? What, what, what if I need that, if I need the law, if I need that legal mechanism to save the animals? And I, I guess what I'm really getting at here is that I am, I am very excited that with my job, that there's some scrutiny on it and that there's a need to change it. But what I'm seeing is that in the anti-carceral movement, there is, there is the anti-carceral movement is very, it's, it's, it's an, a, a critical part now of our movement, but I'm beginning to see some degree of fundamentalism in it. And I would like to push back on that because um, my job is where the rubber meets the road. It's where abstract ideas start to break apart as they hit a concrete situation. You know, it's like, anyway, sorry, I, I, I could go on about that. I, but, but yeah, that's, that, that's it. It, it. it becomes difficult quick. Yeah. I mean, have you ever um, considered going undercover in like an executive role? Um, I, you know, I wish I could, but I can't, um, um, it, you know, everybody, um, I'd, I'd be found out pretty quick. I guess know? that, yeah, I guess that's kind of more the, the role of like whistleblowers. Um, yeah, but yeah. Absolutely. yeah, um, yeah, because that's what we want, right? We want to go after the people at the top, mm. you know, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, how do you, how do you go after the people at the top and not forget about the victims all the way at the bottom, which is, which includes the animals? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, it's like, I, yeah, the way that I see is we have all these ideas in the movement for like how we're, how we're doing things. And, um, and we realize, oh crap, this had like, look, we're, we're, we are kind of, we're persecuting workers at the same time. We shouldn't do that. Right. And part of that solution is that like, especially with the Hispanic community, we want to relate to them in the U.S., bring them into us. We are white as fuck in the animal rights movement. We need a lot more people of color, like, in the movement. Like, like if we want to relate to their communities, bring their communities into us, right? But the other thing is to understand that once we have an idea, like the anti-carceral movement or anything, that we got to have flexibility. Like, we treat, we tend to treat answers in the movement like this could be political or philosophical, this could be anything. We tend to treat answers like, it's like we're climbing up a mountain, right? And we're going past the old ideas and those are the failed ideas. And we get to the top, that's our new idea. And you can't go any higher than this. Like my idea is, is the new thing, it's the answer. But an answers tend to not be like that, even if they're philosophical or political, they tend to be like waves on an ocean. You get on one, it'll take you so far. And then you need to get on another one. You know, that's, that's why I need to be open-minded to, 
changing how I operate and what I do in my job. Mm, that's that's really cool. That's a really good um, approach. I think we could all learn a lot from that. Um, and just thinking about like the meatpacking slaughterhouse person not holding what you know what you've seen is people don't consider this to be a dream job like you've seen that on the ground um like what do you think then from a worker's perspective of the introduction of um you know robots and technology um coming into these uh, spaces to um yeah take over from the from the human i mean it it makes it certainly makes sense um um you know I, I, I especially, I mean, there's so many of the jobs that I could see, you know, r- robots doing. Like it, it certainly makes sense to, to as, as far as like, well, less workers are being exploited, right? Um, but um, it, of, of course, the less, the, the, the less, I, I can't say that there's necessarily going to be less violence if the robots are on the animal handling it, right? Because because part of the reason you have violence is because you know people are people; they get stressed, they get frustrated. But what if you have something there that has no discretion, right? Has no like like is impossible for that thing to have empathy. Well, I can't say it's necessarily going to be a whole lot better. So I would say, especially on the cold side, or what you know, um, it, it it certainly makes sense. But um, you know, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still skeptical skeptical about anything you made coming from it. Yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, if we're creating it and programming it in our own image as well, then those built-in, you know, biases towards cruelty are going to be built into whatever we produce, pr- presumably. Um, one, one of the yeah. things that um, I literally quote you on all the time um, is this. No, this phrase that you 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 spoken about it with us on on various sentient media sessions and and other things. Um, the idea, one of the things that like the vegan community like to tout is that oh you know if uh, if slaughterhouses glass had glass walls everyone would be vegan and your answer is like uh, no because everybody who's in these slaughterhouses isn't vegan. Um, and I and I, th- I you know when you when I first heard you say that it was like you know uh, an eye opener for me because I agree and I believe that not only that we have the culture of cruelty that um, you can elaborate on in a second, but also that we become, abs- we, we just become numb to this stuff. And there's an element of that when we see so much kind of depressing content online as well, when we see snippets of animal cruelty and animal suffering, it's just like, yeah, it's just another kind of, you know, depressing news cycle. And we see it obviously all the time at Sentient Media. Um, but yeah, could you uh, uh, elaborate on this, on the, the culture of cruelty and this idea that we wouldn't all be vegan if slaughterhouses had glass walls? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, thanks for quoting me on that. By the way, that, that's cool. I, um, yeah, I, I think that um, that is. I, I understand the sentiment behind it, but it does miss something, and it's that it, it is. And this is this is going to sound condescending to people that say that. And um, sorry, about to be condescending. <laughs> I'm not, not trying to be a jerk, but I'm going to be a jerk. Right? Is that? Um, now, is, is it, it comes from, understandably, it comes from the point of view of someone who's on the outside and looks on the inside and says, I can't believe what you're doing, I'm going to judge you for it, right? And we tend to not see it like that because we're, we're speaking up for the animals, for these, these victims, right? But um, it, it's, it's that, you know, when you're, when you're part of a culture of cruelty, when you're part of something where law enforcement doesn't care, about what you're doing. The government doesn't care about what you're doing. Everyone does it, right? It's like you've, you swore to yourself, you'd never do something like that. You got stressed enough that you just started doing it. Um, you know, and no one's going to speak up about it because of their immigration and their, 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 perhaps their, you know, criminal status. They already got a record. So no one's going to blow a whistle. They can't get another job, right? Um, it just becomes, you know, accepted. And then also anyone else who's going to report on it you begin to see them as a threat, right? A threat to your culture. In the animal rights movement, we tend to look at that and we, we get angry about that because we believe it's wrong. I believe it's wrong, right? But just believing that it's wrong doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, that it's not normal, right? If, if slaughterhouses had glass walls and everyone could see what was going on every day that they drive by it, way quicker than you think they're gonna stop looking 
and they're going to stop caring. It's part of the reason that we got, um, you know, that, 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 as you well know, a lot of people in the media are just like, I get it. There's animal abuse. What do you want me to do? We all know that. We do that with war now. It's like, okay, there's war. That's terrible. Oh, the war is still going on. How many people are dying? Like, you know, we, we do that in the U.S. with mass shootings all the time. There's more people got killed with, with machine guns. Or I just, just like, we, we just, we just, you know, um, we, we get, we get desensitized quick. And there is a tendency when we are, there's a tendency when we are hurt um, or um, like we're abused or we're hurt or anything. The human, the natural human tendency from an individual is sometimes it's, I don't want anyone else to hurt, but sometimes it's the same reaction as when you have a group of people or a culture that is abused or traumatized. And that is, I want others to feel what I have felt, right? And it's like, if you, and, and you just kind of like, you want to spread it out there. You want to normalize it. You want everyone to know about it. And with the animal rights movement, we feel that. We see these animals getting hurt. And we're like, I can't believe this. Everyone needs to know about this. I'm angry. You need to be angry. And the rest of the world, man, you're, you're a victim. You're a victim of like gun violence. You're a victim in a war. You're, you're, you know, whatever the case is, most people don't want to know about it. And if they do every day, they start, it's, it's like, it's too much trauma for them and they start to forget about it. So yeah, we have to be a little more creative in how we're explaining things to people instead of just shoving it in their face because they, they will quickly not care. I mean, you, you just touched on something there about like, uh, be, being sensitive and also being desensitized like how do you as an undercover investigator who is vegan uh who does not want to you know who wants to see a world where animals aren't suffering like how do you keep hold of that sensitivity whilst also having to be completely desensitized when you're undercover well i'm just totally fucked up in that so <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I would, you know what, it's actually, it's a very, it's, it's very, very complicated. Um, it, it's, it, it, it is, it's that I've, I've certainly been able to, um, I've certainly been able to push things out of my mind and, and then, then it comes back later. Um, and part of what has made that easier is that in undercover work, there's adrenaline. When there's adrenaline involved, everything changes. You don't know it until you have, until you have been there, until you felt it. Like you're, once, once your adrenaline is up, the whole experience changes for you, right? Yeah. If no one can relate to that, maybe you've at least heard people say like, I didn't realize I had trauma until later. That's because in that incident, boom, your adrenaline hit right? You were thinking about everything totally differently. So when, it, when I've seen abuse and all of that, it's not just that I'm seeing abuse. It's not just that I feel terrible for that animal. I'm trying to not get caught while filming, right? I'm, I'm saying to myself, am I looking cool while I'm seeing this, right? Or, or if, I've, if I've snuck away to a place I'm not supposed to be and I'm filming it, am I like, is anyone there? Is anyone coming? Right. That's that that completely changes the experience. And then I can think about it later. Um, at other times, it's just that it's it's very difficult. And with, you know, as opposed to like surveillance or other stuff, it, it's that, you know, with undercover work, it's this particular thing where it's that, you know, you're not saving the animals. Right. But you're glad you got the evidence to then try to tell their story. And in that way, and this is this is dark and complicated, but it's like pride and shame like become like the same thing um and that that just that's something that you know that's something that you just you have to you have to deal with you can't you can't expect anyone to, to understand that if they haven't been through it you just you know I, you sorry know, therapy helps. <laughs> right yeah. therapy helps um yeah. Uh, is there any not to like keep pushing you like into a depressing Absolutely. corner um but I was wondering <laughs> like before you know when you were talking about the puppy mill stuff like is, is there any animal that kind of like like for me the idea of going into a puppy mill is you know to see a dog 
in that in those situations it, you know it, it's so hard or a dog slaughter situation you know these are our companion animals um in this country but you know there are other animals as well farmed animals that kind of get me you know like i can't look at pigs you know it just it's too you know i can't look at gestation crates like it's just too much like is there any animal that like that kind of um penetrates through the adrenaline that you're just like oh shit, i just can't you know or, or is it yeah, just yeah yeah oh yeah absolutely dogs Dogs, dogs, dogs. Dogs are my number one thing. I mean, I have, I have, I have, yeah, I've seen some stuff happen to dogs that, you know, like a, a big part of the reason why I keep trying to do undercover work is it, 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 part of it is because I love undercover work, but part of it is because the first case that I did um, was a successful case. The target was shut down. Um, literally hundreds of dogs, you know, were saved in the end. But but the things that happened, the things that I did, the things I didn't do is the kind of stuff where if I was to be like, all right, well, you know, done with that. I'm going to go, I'm going to go on a speaking tour. And, you know, I mean, like I would, I would really have to be a special kind of dirtbag because like, because, you know, <laughs> because I, 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 you know, I owe it to dogs i owe it to all animals but i owe it to dogs to keep to keep going and and i guess i should say real quick uh, much love to all the investigators that have left the profession and that are and that are speaking about it <laughs> i didn't mean anything negative about that i just meant that you know for me i just i i i i have i just haven't you know i, I just feel like i just need to keep doing something because i yeah yeah dog, dogs have a special place in my heart there's and um it's, it's made it it's it's made it difficult with the puppy mill work, but you know, keeps me pushing with the puppy mill work. Mm. I mean, uh, my next question was going to be about which, like, animal exploiting industry you think is the most corrupt. I guess I don't know if you would go and, and pick puppy mills there, but is there any animal exploiting industry that you've worked in that you think is like this is just the worst? The worst, the absolute worst, um, as far as corruption. I would, man, puppy mills and factory farming, they're really kind of, you know, one thing. They even cover each other a lot, um, even in how they're sold, right? Like you sell meat products and you're like, okay, well, we've got to have some safety measures here. And also we're going to start to have animal welfare standards. And there's going to, and it's all the welfare standards are bullshit, right? They're quite literally, um, for meat, it's that to say that the meat is safe and, and that everything's humane, you say it's USDA inspected. And with puppies, it's the exact same thing. You go to a pet store and they say, you know that, that everything is humane and fine because they're USDA inspected. Um, so yeah, and, and trying to get law enforcement, like that's another thing is a lot of people may not know about the US. It's like you see, if you see, we're talking, we're talking really bad cruelty. Like um, we're talking like the cruelty that you saw recently on that, uh, that livestock neglect case I had in Kansas, right? Like animals just, just you know, carcasses on top of carcasses because they're dying. Um, you know, well, I mean, you know, not too, not too far from there, um, I documented a puppy mill where it was just dogs living in their own waste, and you know, there's you know, and you know, living in wire cages, and the person didn't have a license. Or I've seen dogs that are you know living, they're just their bowls are filled with ice. They have open wounds. It doesn't matter. Dogs, cattle, sheep, it makes no difference. In the United States, 99% of the time, local cops, they're not gonna move on someone like that because those are agricultural animals. So the corruption is the same. And in the Philippines, you know, with dog slaughter, um, I found it like that as well. You know, um, it was just, it was, man, I was foolish to go to the Philippines and, and go work a dog slaughter case and think that think something was gonna get done yeah that's really rough um sorry it's super depressing <laughs> listeners um, <laughs> everything is terrible <laughs> yeah. oh well um so okay all right uh let's 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 go to a happy place like say yeah, yeah. All, say all you know corruption and all uh of these things are, are wiped out um and we no longer need undercover investigators um what would you do with your time um, let's see, I would scream at and punch walls and, um, I, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I uh, <laughs> um, I would, I, I, you know what, if, if 
I would have, I know I would remain active in the movement in some capacity. Um, um, I, I, I'd probably get involved with animal rescue. Um, you know, um, I volunteer to rescue. I'd probably get more involved, you know, with rescue, but um, I would have to do investigations in, in some capacity, whether that's for another movement or whatever the case is. But I, I love investigations. Um, mm. So, yeah. yeah. We, we really appreciate everything you're doing. And obviously, you know, Senia Media is a, is a home for you. And we, we do love working with you and, and finding out how we can get your stories out there. And I know you're working on a course for us right now about, um, about undercover investigations, which will be coming out in the yeah. Writers Collective real soon. Um, so very excited about that. And you've got some great, uh, great speakers in there as well, right? Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Some, some really cool people. Um, yes. Some famous people, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is going to be very exciting to uh, to get that out into the world. Um, so, I mean, like I had like so many uh, more questions that I wanted to talk to you. We're going to have to do this again sometime. Like I'd love to get into detail um, next time about the the work you've done at sea. I know we've done our life at sea yeah. session before, but I just find that like what you did there, your relate. Your, I guess you could talk briefly about this um, because you what you did was so smart because you had this strategic approach to how you were gonna like tie your investigation to a legislation that was likely to get passed in, in, in California. Um, would you mind, this is the Gilnets story, would you mind um, telling us a little bit about that and like, yeah, how, how, what you did there? Yeah, yeah, um, so there, uh, I wanted to do a commercial fishing case um, for no other reason than I just didn't think anyone, no one was looking for me on a commercial fishing boat. Um, and I was trying to figure out how am I going to do something that's going to make a difference? And I thought, okay, well, um, if, if we could, if we could like pass the law, ban a fishery and get, if that'd be great, but we have to have the press on it, right? So what's the press going to focus on? Well, the press is going to focus on cute animals, right? And, you know, it's not fish and squid and all that. Look, they're just not, they're just not cute to most people, but I realized that the drift gillnet boats are consistently killing dolphins and sea lions. So I thought if I get on those boats and I film the cute animals coming up and dying, the press will jump on it and then a law could get passed to ban that fishery. And uh, yeah, super long story, very short. That's what happened. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. And well, and the power of your strategic thinking about like which area to target, you know, I mean, that's like, that's what we, that's what we always strive to do is like how do we figure out which areas to target which things to cover that are going to be the most you know have the most impact um so no it's a uh, super awesome um pete it's been so 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 cool to speak to you today um where should we direct i mean obviously you're under you're an active undercover investigator so it's hard to kind of build a personal brand and stuff during this right, right. <laughs> where's your twitter account um, um where should yeah. we direct people um, so let's see, um, I do a lot of work for, uh, and I'm the director of investigations for C Strategies for Ethical and Environmental Development. Um, I also work for uh, the Companion Animal Protection Society, Humane Society of the United States, and Great 2K USA. Those are my clients right now. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to read my book, it's Rescue Dogs. But if someone wants to reach out, those are the groups I work for. So amazing thank you and i hope you come back and um we'll we'll catch up on your on your current investigation at some point um but yeah thank you so much for being here thank you